The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The views, information, or opinions expressed by hosts or guests are their own. Neither the show nor any of its content should be construed as investment advice or as a recommendation to buy or sell any particular security. Security-specific information shared on this podcast should not be relied upon as a basis for your own investment decisions. Be sure to do your own research. The podcast hosts and participants may have a position in the securities mentioned personally through sub-accounts and or through separate funds and may change their holdings at any time. Welcome to This Week in Intelligent Investing, where we examine timely and timeless investing topics to help you become a better investor. Enjoy authentic, unscripted discussion featuring Phil Ordway, Elliot Turner, and other thought-leading investors. Brought to you by MOI Global. And now, here's your host, John Michalczewicz. A warm welcome to all of you joining us for this new episode of This Week in Intelligent Investing. Great to have you with us and great to be back with my co-hosts, Elliot Turner and Phil Ordway. We have a great uh, discussion ahead. Let's uh, start it with you, Phil, please. Sure. Thanks, John. So I wanted to talk briefly this week, uh, revisit, partially revisit a subject we've talked about in the past, which is distressed distressed debt in particular, the, one of my favorite areas of opportunity, something I used to spend a lot of time on years ago, but as I've lamented a few times here on this podcast, has been a really barren desert for many years, at least for me. Uh, and it, you know, I think this ties in really well with the podcast we did uh, with Max Frooms, one of the co-authors of the Caesars Palace coup a couple of months ago, uh, which was an amazing overview of a distressed situation that that dragged on and on and on. But the thing that's striking me today is I was just looking up some of these returns the other day, and one of the leading distressed indices this year is down almost 17%. So we're recording this June 14th, 2022. And you see that kind of number, and it's, it's pretty shocking. Last year, that same index was up 24%. Um, and to see it decline so sharply in a time when you know, the, the, I guess the the jump in interest rates are obviously the elephant in the room here because no one has been spared from that pain. But I think a lot of people would have expected things that were in that index to potentially perform a little better. And look, the index isn't perfect. I'm not calling it out as a as an exact representation of what out what's out there. But I think it's fair to say that even distressed has felt pain this year. And the one thing that I keep coming back to, though, and this is where I want to hear from you guys about what you think is that this is not a normal cycle or a normal situation to the extent that such a thing as a normal situation or cycle even exists. But you know, I, you're hearing these constant drumbeat of predictions of a recession, basically. And everybody seems convinced that either the Fed's going to drive us off a cliff and or you know, the economy is just naturally going to dip into this recessionary environment if we're not already there. And when that happens, you know, you should generally start thinking about looking at companies that have gotten into financial distress because it can be a really opportune time to buy those securities if you know what you're doing. But this time, I'm just not so sure for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the companies that came into this cycle with bad balance sheets had really bad balance sheets, and they often had really bad businesses on top of them. And that does not bode well. I'm thinking specifically about prior analogs here, like the recapitalization of the oil industry, ironically, in 2013, 2014, when oil absolutely collapsed, and there was a flood of distressed capital that went into those situations. And that first round of capital got completely obliterated. It was really, really ugly. The second round of capital, or to the extent there was one, a third round of recapitalizations actually probably produced pretty good returns. But the first money in got really, really poor returns, and in a lot of cases, negative returns. And I think the same situation probably holds true for anybody that's participating today, just because one, you still have an absolute flood of dry powder, distressed capital that's out there waiting to be deployed. And two, I don't think you have any, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of unnatural restructurings, right? I mean, we can all point to situations in the past where some exogenous force took an otherwise good business with a bad balance sheet and and forced restructuring. And those are absolute nirvana because you can fix the balance sheet during the restructuring and you're left with the good business. I don't see too many of those today. And and again, I don't have a systematic way of quantifying this so much. You know, we can look at spreads, we can look at default rates so far, we can look at recoveries. None of those paint a particularly optimistic picture either either way. So it, it kind of 
helps my point here, but I, I just don't know what to expect. And so I'm not, uh, I'm frankly spending less time looking at it than I otherwise would, because this would be the part in the show where I would start getting really interested in it. I, I've started looking and Elliot and John, we've, we've kind of talked about this a little bit offline. I've started looking a little bit at some of the busted converts that are out there. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting area. It's not necessarily distressed per se, but it's, it's kind of a, a related area that you could look at. And I do think that's interesting, but again, so far, you know, it seems like you're taking some level of risk for an amount of return that I'm just not sure is commensurate at this point, but I'm sure I'm missing a few out there. And I do think particularly as you start looking at some of these fallen angels in tech, um, you, you know, that, that can be a good area to, apply some of the analysis. If, you, if you're if you lacking some of the conviction you'd need on the common, that can be a really interesting way to explore it. And likewise, there's some preferred issues out there that I think are probably starting to become pretty interesting. I was looking at a, a real estate company uh, the other day that is, again, an, it, it, the stock's gotten absolutely annihilated. The, the, the capital structure isn't really public on the debt side, but you can sort of imply where the debt would be trading and it would, it would be at a distressed or near distressed level. Um, but the equity is, you know, basically an out of the money option, but there's preferreds trading at $16 on 25 face. So, you know, pretty significant discount. And those are the kinds of opportunities I'm looking at. But again, I mean, just the, the typical situation where a company's in or near an actual bankruptcy and you're trying to pick the fulcrum security and doing a recovery analysis and waterfall to try to figure out what's going to happen. I just haven't seen really any of those that look all that appealing. And so, you know, I'm kind of left here wondering what I'm missing or what might be different this time. But I think the one thing that is without much doubt is that there is just a flood of capital sitting out there on the sidelines and that we all have to pay attention to that because it's going to impact returns for sure. So wonder if you guys have looked at this or what your thoughts are. Yeah, I have a few thoughts. So to caveat, distressed is not my background, and um, you know, take it for what it's worth. But it does seem like there are a few forces at play that make distressed just a smaller area than it's been in past cycles. First, at the highest level, you know, corporate leverage is actually pretty damn low. Um, and some of the more levered sectors over the last decade have had a comeuppance and have largely been recapitalized. Specifically, I'm thinking first financials and then energy. So what you're left with in terms of like the kind of S&P universe, you really have amongst the lowest uh, debt ratios in the index's history. Um, and that's already with fairly low rates. So the interest burdens are not all that burdensome. But perhaps there's some light at the end of the tunnel for the distressed world with rates spiking quickly and some companies who hadn't necessarily, though I'd have to say they were irresponsibly so and not doing uh, as much, extended their maturities out far enough. Um, but I was just looking at a growthier company who issued a pretty big portion of today's market cap in converts during the 2020 exuberance. And so, you know, as a portion of their EV, these converts are now upwards of 30%. And I think it's a significant overhang on the stock. And so come uh, the next couple of years, I'll try to be vague so as not to call it out specifically, uh, come the next couple of years, they are absolutely going to have to um, either harvest enough cash flow from their balance sheet or find other ways to tap capital markets and get some cash to you know refinance when the time comes. Um, but anyway, you know, long story short, I think this general idea that there's just way less debt out there, that we've been through a period where if you couldn't refinance into a better cap structure over the last couple of years, you probably were not worth uh, much um, enthusiasm, even in a distressed scenario, uh, makes it a really challenging environment for that corner of the universe. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I, I 
you hate to be critical of people that have jobs that are difficult. And that certainly applies to executives and CFOs in this case and, and boards that approve it. But any CFO and CEO and board that didn't term out their liability structure to give them at least a weighted average maturity of five to seven years, if they have any sort of debt on the balance sheets right now, committed absolute malpractice and they should be completely and totally embarrassed. And, you know, I mean, the analogy would be on the same side. Like if you took out a mortgage in 2010, like I did and didn't refinance it a couple of times on the way down to just take advantage of the optionality that was afforded you by this amazing gift of low interest rates, you, you just made a historically dumb decision. So yeah, I mean, that it's a, it's a big red flag for me when I go out looking at some of these companies that had the chance to raise debt when they didn't necessarily have a gun to their head or term out liabilities when they had the opportunity to do it. And now you've seen companies raising debt at 10, 11% coupons and watching it trade off even further. And it's kind of like, well, game's up, right? But in, in most of those cases, I also find those balance sheets that were driven by bad decisions are paired with bad businesses. So I, I just don't see much of an opportunity yet, but hopefully that'll change. Yeah, I totally agree with both of you and uh, don't have a ton to add. I guess for me, it just comes down to you know how this environment will play out with inflation where it is, and then interest rates um, where they're heading. And you know, fundamentally, the the rate of inflation is still quite a bit above uh, where interest rates are, and it'll probably stay that way for a while, unless inflation uh, magically comes down. And uh, I feel like generally, when you have inflation. Um, far above uh, the interest rate, that's stimulative. And it could actually be, be a good environment for a lot of those companies. The problem is really in the timing, because if your costs go up before the revenue comes in, you know, it's kind of the inflated revenue, uh, you're going to be in trouble. Um, but for a lot of companies that can kind of weather this interim storm, uh, they're going to see their revenue go up as well uh, with inflation. And if they're paying an interest rate that's still reasonably low, um, that could actually work out. But obviously, it's going to be a minefield and there will be blowups, but there will be others that uh, may trade as if they're going to be blowups, but could end up being uh, home runs. Yeah, there could be some home runs out there. That's a good point. And that's what I'm what I'm trying to look for because, you know, one interesting thesis that I can't really act upon. I'm I'm certainly not the world's greatest macro trader, that's for sure, at the far other end of the spectrum there is. But I think things are moving quickly. And I think, you know, as we've discussed a million times, it's it's obviously true that people usually fight the last war. And so look, it's becoming a problem that inflation expectations are high and not going down, but that you wouldn't expect the public's expectations to go down at this point, given that inflation continues to be high and might even be ticking higher. But look, it's not going to take much for those expectations to start reversing, right? I mean, there are a lot of deflationary trends that are at least partially counteracting on the inflationary trends. And I don't think it should be a total shock to anybody that if we get a couple of more big rate hikes and things start to cool off, just as, you know, Six months ago, nobody could talk about anything but you know supply chain issues and semiconductor shortages and labor shortages and all this kind of stuff. And here we are six months later, and the only thing that matters is inflation. We're all going into recession. I would I would bet pretty strongly that by December we're all talking about something a little bit different. I mean, I it it I think inflation will still be an issue. I'm not making a transitory argument by any stretch of the imagination, but I just wouldn't want to make any investment bets over two to five years that depend on this environment persisting, because in one way or another, I think it's going to change. You remember when it was soaring lumber prices that were killing oh, the housing we've had market? That a, what a we've had that a, Yeah, we've had that a couple of times. And I, you know, it, we've talked about housing on here, and I think it still remains a really fascinating area to study because you've got all of these counteracting, these kind of countervailing trends that are working against each other in opposite directions. And I don't, know which way it's going to tip this year. I mean, you're obviously seeing a huge slowdown in in housing activity right now, and particularly new purchases as the mortgage, the 30-year fixed has just crossed well over 6% now, which is stunning on a you know year-over-year basis. But And, and you now have in, in a lot of markets, it's become cheaper again to rent than own. Uh, 
but I, I don't know. Like I, I still think over a few year period, um, the outlook looks pretty reasonable. So we'll see. Yeah. I don't mean to get farther down the macro track, but it's like, even with what's going on now, uh, you know, you all, uh, memorialized having made the transitory argument. So we're not going to go further down that well, but I do think it's even at one of those junctures where you got to question whether the Fed's tools could fight this kind of inflation, or we need some sort of like supply side intervention in certain areas to get it to knock down or just market forces to do their thing and time to run its course. But markets are not very into waiting these things out at the moment. And, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, I saw something referencing the amount of mentions of recession uh, on market declines heading into recessions, and it's usually like a lagging indicator, and it's a leading yeah. indicator right now. Right. And I think one of the realities of, um, I don't mean risk management in the investment sense, but risk management in the uh, like uh, grand. Uh, metaphysical sense, when everyone sees the risk of something, often there are already forces in play that are there to self-calibrate and avoid it. So I'm not saying there won't be a recession. I mean, arguably we're in one and there's no functional difference to me between what we are in right now and a recession. So like, who the hell cares about these kinds of semantics? But there are like very much self-correcting mechanisms to what you're aware of. And you know, I mean, I've seen passing references to 08. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that was yeah. credit driving the economy lower, like contractions mm-hmm. in credit preceded the onset of a recession. And here it's literally inflation and the Fed reacting to inflationary impulses, which once upon a time was called a normal recession, which you often end with a much healthier backdrop and healthier construct construct. And like, you know, I started at the top uh, with, with corporate credits, but household balance sheets are really damn good too. Uh, and that runs a gamut of income spectrums speaking relative to historical norms. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe you get a healthier uh, recovery out of recession. And one of the charts I was like really looking at the last couple of days, it first came to my attention and, uh, article in Wall Street Journal that was kind of like the the Yellen and Powell mea culpa, but gross domestic purchases. And it's kind of interesting because there was this trend line going back from the post-World War II period that we kind of hugged right beneath uh, for forever. Um, and it, uh, you know, if you, if you plan it on a log scale, it, it kind of caves in ever so slowly each year. But um, we deviated very far from it in the financial crisis. And there was this big debate whether we actually, um, you know, had a structural decline in our ability to grow coming out of the GFC, right? Secular stagnation, a phrase we've heard a lot. Or if we had done more intervention on stimulus earlier, we could have been on track in a better way sooner. And what's interesting is in early 2022, we got back to the trend line that had been in place from World War II through 2007, 2008? I don't know. Is it ephemeral or is there something to the fact that, you know, this is just a prolonged return to what truly would have been normal and that what we're going through now is the turbulence of having geared our economy for demand based on secular stagnation. And we now have demand based on what had been the prior normal. Anyway, I hope that all made sense, but that's something I've been thinking about a lot. No, that, that's an interesting one. And I, I agree with a bunch of those those points. I mean, another analogy that I wanted to make to the, the current environment, because you kind of mentioned this or alluded to it, was we're coming off this period of crazy speculation, right? And you can point the finger at almost everybody over the last couple of years, whether it's just your average weekend Joe gambling on sports from his couch or YOLOing game GameStop options or Robin Hood nonsense, or I don't share this view, but some people would definitely have the view that the Fed was speculating by throwing so much money at a problem and hoping they could get out okay on the other side. Again, that's not how I would view it, but that's really, you could look at just about every asset class, uh, you know, particularly things like SPACs and cryptos that just went absolutely crazy. And now the air is coming out the other side. But as it pertains to what matters going forward, to your point, 08, 09 is a completely irrelevant 
example here that it really doesn't have anything to do with the current situation. And even the dot com boom and bust of 20 years ago, it, it's somewhat of a stretched analogy, but it's at least a little more instructive in this case, in my opinion. And if you look back at that period, you had this enormous bubble get unwound and asset prices suffered not across the board, but in certain pockets and at the indices level, they all declined. But there really wasn't any sort of distressed opportunity. And if you stuck to quote unquote value type stuff or, you know, good old fashioned distress back then, you did really well. I mean, that that period of 2000, 2001 through 2007 was like the golden era for a whole bunch of quote unquote value oriented managers. And I don't know that that's going to be the case this time, but I think it's at least more plausible than a lot of other explanations that I'm hearing. But you know, again, I, I just pulled this up as an interesting uh, kind of anecdotal piece of evidence as to what's been going on here. So uh, looking at American Airlines, which is a company in an industry that I understand pretty well, and I think it's a great canary in the coal mine, so to speak, because it's it, it's at the mercy of just about everything you'd care about, right? I mean, it's directly impacted by oil and commodities, supply chain, labor markets, inflation, consumer demand, every macro thing you could ever possibly imagine. Every micro force is working on this industry. It really matters. This is a company that's a good example of one where, I hate to say it, but I don't think they did a great job managing their balance sheet for the last 10 years. And so they came into this mess of both COVID and now the high commodity, high inflation environment that we're living in with a weak balance sheet. And one of their benchmark issues, the the three and three quarters of 2025, you know, those fell absolutely off a cliff when COVID hit, right? They went from, you know, just under par to like 35 cents on the dollar uh, by April and May of 2020. And then they they bounced around, but you know, as as things stabilized and the government came back and got involved, they climbed all the way back up to 75 cents on the dollar by the end of 2020. And, and really ever since the first quarter of 2021, they've bounced around 90 cents on the dollar, right? Which is not all that attractive, in my opinion, because that's a whopping uh let's see here. That's a whopping 705 basis points. Over Treasury, it's a yield the worst of ten percent, a little over ten percent. But I mean, for the for the risk you're taking here, is that really all that exciting? I mean, it's it's certainly not implying it. You know, a dollar price of eighty four cents on the dollar and a and a spread of seven hundred over is not implying any sort of near term distress. And I can guarantee you that airline creditors are as shrewd and appropriately nervous as anybody out there. And when they smell trouble. They are not sitting there waiting for things to get better on a lark. They are they are sharp and they are attuned. And if there was some horrendous outcome right around the corner, if all these recession fears were truly baked in, these bonds should be at least ten, if not thirty points lower. Um, because if a, if a real nasty recession was around the corner, I mean that, that would be particularly bad for this issuer, and these bonds would be very likely impaired. So uh, again, this just points out that I'm shocked that the indices are showing such poor returns because you look at some of these anecdotal prices and it's like, boy, I just don't see the indiscriminate selling and the the juicy future returns that I would kind of expect at this point, given all the, the pain that's been taken in the equity markets and the pain that's been taken elsewhere, which I think just, again, reflects the fact that we came into this with really high asset prices. That's one of the weird dynamics right now too, though. I mean, you're isolating on one of the pockets where Without a doubt, the trends are better than they've been the last two years. Um, and so even if things get worse, they are better. <laughs> and there are other areas where the story is the exact opposite. And, you know, I, I don't have any answers because I think the cross currents are just so freaking intense. I went to a lunch yesterday with someone who's been doing this for many decades, longer than I, because I was trying to get perspective. And he was like, I've never seen so many cross currents in my entire career. And like all the key signals I'd looked at for like consumer health and everything else tell me I should be like all things go. And then, you know, you, you just have a general awareness of inflation and what the Fed's going to do. And it's like, eh, I don't know. But like we haven't been in even like former normal recessions uh, position quite like this. So I think that's one of the challenges we're all grappling with. And I think that's part of why, like, for many, the 
reflexive instinct is to run for the hills rather than, you know, wait to see resolution on some of the key questions. Yeah, I agree. And, and look, I, it might be a good segue to another topic we're talking about because there are so many cross currents right now. I mean, it, it is it is whiplash inducing when you sit there and try to think about everything that's happened in the past couple of years and everything that could happen from here and all the things that matter, but can't really be forecasted accurately, at least by me and by most people. It, it's, it is, it, the cross currents are unbelievable right now. So let's uh, segue into that, Phil. I think we're talking about investor fatigue. I think many of us are feeling that and, uh, I don't know who wants to kick it off uh, on that. Uh, well, I'll stuff. start. I'll start just because I think it's an interesting segue from what we talked about a minute ago. Whereas I think everybody, for the last few months, at least you know maybe after January, when they realized that there might be a regime regime change at hand, I think the natural reaction for a lot of portfolio managers is where can I go hide? And they're just other than energy, I guess, which, you know, we kind of talked about this a little a couple of weeks ago. It's really hard to time those sector rotations and get those right. And if you don't, I mean, look, if you have the view that oil is going to go to $175 a barrel, then yeah, that's a, an obvious place to go hide. But if you're not making that at bed explicitly, where do you go hide right now? And that comes on top of, you know, a war in Ukraine, in Europe that is, is still stunning and dramatically impacting world events geopolitical tensions at large, the kind we haven't seen in decades, um, you know, all sorts of supply chain and labor market distortions, both in the U.S. and globally, you know, kind of a historic market meltdown, at least in the sense that you've never had both stocks and bonds both getting hit this hard at once, at least in most people's lifetimes. You're still dealing with COVID and the fallout of that. I mean, it's just one thing after another and it's all piled up. And i and again, I think maybe the most salient part of all this is that despite that, most of those issues piling up over the past couple of years, for at least the first two thirds of that era or three quarters of the last couple of years, you've seen this crazy bullish speculative activity that's like nothing I've ever witnessed. And I, I just, it's it's hard to know what to make of it, right? It's hard to know where to turn from here. I certainly don't see anywhere to hide. And I start to wonder when we'll see true capitulation because I don't think we've seen anything close to it yet. I think you're going to see a lot more implosions. I think the Archegos thing, you know, could be just the tip of the iceberg in terms of some of the behavior that's been going on behind the scenes. You know, you're starting to see some of that unwind that you might expect potentially bubbling up in the crypto world, but I don't think we want to go into that too much. It's just, it's hard to figure out where to even start looking in a lot of ways, which is again, why I started going down the the rabbit hole of distress, because it can be a really good place to ward off so-called investor fatigue, because it's a different analysis. It's a different set of factors that are going to, you know, make or break the, the investment outcome. But in this case, I don't know. It's, it's tough. Yeah. It's something that came up in our uh, podcast with Mike Nongap last week. And if you haven't listened to that, like, please do yourself a favor and go listen to it. Um, I don't want to say immediately because we're still going to say some stuff from here, but pretty damn soon. Um, that these last three years are about as intense as they get. You know, it's not often that you have two, I, I hate the phrase bear market being a technical thing, but two bear markets um, within three years where the middle of it, most of us have spent relegated to our houses, couches, whatever, um, where there are just all kinds of, I also hate the phrase unprecedented, but unprecedented questions that people have to grapple with, right? Starting with COVID and running through today's uh, inflationary environment um, with a speculative frenzy in the middle. My God, you know, that's a lot. And I, I don't know, after the interview with Mike, um, after thinking about that, because I would not put it in those terms before. And I thought it was interesting to hear someone else say that. I was like, I had this really weird dream where I was like sitting down with an older investment sage. It was a nondescript person, but distinctly not Warren Buffett, right? just want to put that out there. And I was told like, I get this opportunity to ask this sage one question and one question only. And like, what, what, what's your own question? And in my dream, my one question was, 
how do you stay sane doing this all these years? And his response was family, nature, reading, and writing. And it was like so perfect and so weird. And I like don't usually remember my dreams at all. But I think part of that is the exhaustion of my brain being constantly on, um, trying to think about like, you know, the manifest risks, re-underwriting the portfolio and focusing on what I think is a pretty broad opportunity set that runs from busted converts to, you know, some high quality. One one thing that I think is different in this sell-off than others is some people might quibble with my language here, but a lot of times it's like, distinctly the crap that gets beaten down the most. But there's some really high quality stuff that obviously started from the high end of the valuation range that's getting destroyed. And I think there's like more quality that's scraping the bottom of the barrel in this particular sell-off than I've seen in other instances. And I think that's interesting. You know, there's often this debate, like, I think a lot of people have this inclination that when things hit the fan, they want to up the quality of their portfolio. And by and large, that's a mistake if you're expecting a bounce back anytime soon, because you know it's, it's really the crap that flies first um, and the cyclical stuff. But cyclical stuff is kind of strong now. And uh, quality stuff is really where I think the predominance of pain is. And so like, you know, I think that's a fundamentally different nature to this sell-off than other times. I think the reason why people are like, yeah, I want to up the quality of my portfolio is what's easy to do with quality is when things get volatile and you start questioning yourself and you're feeling pain. You're like, well, I know what I got is quality so I could stick with it. (laughs) And so, you know, I think that's, it plays into the exhaustion. Like that's a way to be less exhausted. And um, yeah, it's just weird times. And I think, you know, a lot of people are feeling it. Uh, There's been, uh, I think, um, this entire epic, as I was referencing with the lunch, the, the gentleman who's been doing this for decades, um, this is this is something that even people who've been doing this a long time are like, I don't know. I've never seen this before. I heard Stan Druckenmiller say the same thing in his pot, in, in the interview he did this weekend, like unprecedented. That, that That's the only word to describe it. And that gets exhausting when it persists for so damn long. And and isn't it isn't it making it harder on yourself if you're trying to rotate in and out of quality versus whatever the opposite of quality is, and you know trying to time up these rotations and outguess what's going to work because that seems like a really tough errand for me. So I guess the only good news I have for myself because I'm suffering from the same fatigue that everyone else is. I mean it it has been a it has been a confounding and exhausting couple of years. There's no denying that, but I at least haven't had to change any of the principles or any of the tactics too much because I just don't try to anticipate a lot of that kind of stuff. And it enables me to focus a little more on what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to accomplish and looking out three to five years and thinking about the business first and making sure I've got room to be wrong and all the good stuff that we always talk about. And it, it helps because otherwise it's very easy to get lost right now, right? It's very easy to just be swept out to sea because the cross currents are so crazy. Yeah, no, it's the truth. Like it's much like our conversation about sector rotation. If you try to go from quality to not quality, et cetera, you know, that's really hard. Although where I do think it comes in is if you've always been, you know, there there were, uh, maybe I'm guilty of it in part myself. I, I don't think entirely, but um, some people who are like, I, I just buy quality, right? Not much valuation framework. I just buy quality. I want to own, I want to own quality. Um, but, you know, if you're always focused on the interplay of quality and valuation, well, when valuation resets, the interplay changes. So you get different companies that come into your purview or leave it or whatever, depending on where things are. Um, So I think that's part of what's interesting. And yeah, the market is more divided and spliced into these factors than ever. I think Um, one of the things that that this gentleman was telling me, like, you know, in other sell-offs, you'd have way more dispersion, Um, way, way more of the market today trades is functionally one trade. Um, And I think that has, you you know, that's a theme I've mentioned a lot over time on this. And I think that's one of the biggest, um, I think, uh, challenges for a lot of us to deal with over this time on the way up and the way down. And it's like, how do you separate yourself other than, 
you know, how much of investing today is picking which factor you want to be exposed to versus which company. Um, right. I, that's really challenging right now. It is. And that's why I think if you have the framework and the temperament to do it, I think it can still help to just figure out the businesses you want to own for at least three to five years and, and start there and try to tune out the rest of the noise. Because you're right, like there hasn't been a lot of dispersion, you know, like, like I said, I mean, even even the bond indices and the distress stuff. I mean, again, outside of energy, pretty much everything's down 10 to 20% year to date. And we all know there's plenty of stuff that's down 50 to 80% year to date, individual securities and individual funds and that sort of thing. So there really isn't much of a place to hide. So it just is what it is. I mean, these are these are to be expected from time to time. They're, they're somewhat rare. It's not like this happens every year or even every decade, but it definitely comes along at least a few times in a in an investing career and you've got to make the best of it. Yeah, I think uh, those are great points. Uh, if we really are in a bear market, um, which it seems we are, you know, I guess historically it would it just doesn't end that quickly. So I feel like we just need to settle in uh, for the bear market and um, you know try to run the portfolio in a way that it can withstand it. I think you know, Elliot, uh, what you say about just everything feeling like one trade um, that makes it really difficult to kind of rebalance the portfolio and maybe allocate from things that are, you know, um, have less of a discount to fair value to some other things that are really, really compelling now. Um, you know, I know just looking at at stuff, um, I don't really have things to sell so that I can buy other things that are also extremely attractive. And um, that's challenging. You know, maybe in the energy space, there's, there's stuff that, that can be sold. But then again, you also don't want to end up with a lopsided portfolio in in, in any one sector, I guess, uh, as well. So, yeah, I, I I'm not sure. I would say we're at the fatigue stage yet for you know just investors as a whole. I think there that it there hasn't been enough time that's passed for um, the whole market to kind of have given up on equities. You know, once we we if if this market truly uh, becomes the bear market that it could be just given where we started on on valuations you know it's probably not going to end till there's some kind of a cover uh, story that says death of equities you know so it's still probably going to take a while yeah i agree i mean just again i don't have a way of perfectly quantifying this without looking at some really sloppy shortcuts like you know cyclically adjusted multiples and that kind of stuff which i don't think has much value or utility in this kind of world but i think what does work at least for me is to just take as many individual data points as i can where in cases where i'm capable of understanding them and saying you know is this an attractive opportunity is this good business being priced as a bad business is this opportunity being misvalued somewhere or another and i don't I don't see it in a lot of places yet. So I think there's still quite a ways to go down in, in certain situations. But again, you know, that's not a particularly valuable prediction because if one thing changes here or there around the around the margins, you know, lots of things could reverse. I would have never in a million years predicted what happened between February and August of 2020. So that, that and that's what matters. Yeah, you know, I mean let's be clear. We're not talking about fatigue in the sense of like the market has hit fatigue. It's more about like how crazy these last three years have been. And a big part of that is just, you know, we've had several cycles within a very short period of time yep. and things are happening extremely quickly. Um, so I, I do think that's one of the challenges to grapple with. And it's like, you could deb debatably this bear market started like, you know, way back in February, 2021 with the momentum blow off. And, uh, you know, so we, maybe we've been in it for a lot longer than it seems, depending on where you've been positioned uh, or where you've been focused. And um, even on the S&P uh, in the post great financial crisis era, it's already the most days we've gone uh, without, um, I don't remember if it's recouping highs or, or actually, you know, making a, a distinct low. 
I think it's recouping highs. Um, but yeah, it's the second most, second longest pullback since 2015 to 2016, which, you know, we went down 19.9%. So we're not allowed to officially call it a bear market, but <laughs> um, it kind of was one in its own special way. So yeah, you know, they all take different sizes, shapes, forms, and there are very different consequences. You know, I like kind of napkinning out so consensus says we're going to do like 249 next year. Uh, let's say like a low end valuation in the recent era would be like 14 times um, EPS. That puts you a little below 3,500. And you could say like, what degree do I want a haircut uh, next year's EPS? And um, then you start playing with like, where are some levels that I'd be a little more willing to take uh, more risk or think about the market a little more constructively. Um, but we've gotten within spitting distance of those ranges. Like I'd say, I'd say fairly quickly. Yeah, it is. It has been, it has been sharp. There's no doubt, but I was looking at something you were, you were just talking about some of the various admittedly arbitrary definitions of stuff. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was, uh, 33 days and you have to obviously evaluate this in hindsight but 33 days from peak to trough in uh in the spring or late winter of 2020 and if you look back at some of the prior drawdowns like 2000 and you know particularly going way back into the you know the 60s and 70s you know it's not uncommon for the for the drawdown period to be two or three years right and that's what i think is really lacking and really stunning for a lot of people because i think for better or worse, a lot of the people that have been allocating capital in the past few years were not doing that and were not investing in 2008, 2009, 2010. I guess the high was just before that. I think it was technically 2007, but um, you know that was a pretty rough couple of years for people, and you know it, it shook out a lot. And I think 2000 to 2000. Two was was a pretty rough period for a lot of people, and it just seems like ancient history at this point. And if the fatigue is bad now, I agree with what John was getting at. It could get a whole lot worse before long. Well, let's make that period sound even worse because the market made highs in 2000, and in I think it was September of 2007, it had I don't even think for a week held above the highs from 2000 by a modest percent or so. And then went all the way back down to the early 2000s lows. So it was really like over a decade of no return in equities was what people the, were dealing yeah, with. Yeah, and the NASDAQ, was, the NASDAQ was like 15 or 16 years, wasn't it? From, yep. from, from peak to peak. I mean, it was really crazy. Yep. Though, you know, one of the counterpoints, I saw an interesting chart from RBC. I don't put much stock, pun not intended, in these kinds of charts. Um, but it was like, if you look at the 17-year cycles of the U.S. Um, stock market in the post-World War II period, God, I, I mean, this is all garbage anyway, but it's like, you know, I'm sorry, not post-World War II, but since the 1920s, it's like you had 17 years of deflation before we reemerged post-World War II. You had 17 years of reflation. Then you had, you know, you get into the 70s, 70s and early 80s. It's 17 years of sideways of inflation. Then another 17 years of disinflation, which gets you to the 2000 blow off. And then it took 17 years for the market to actually break out above the uh, 2000s high. <laughs> and they're like, so the case is made that we're you know pretty early in the next reflation after having had a deflation period. Who the hell knows? I, again, like I don't put much, put much stock in this, but it's interesting to think uh, about like the lengths with which certain periods can last, the false starts and stops along the way, hopes and despairs, and everything else. Um, yeah, that's age, a story as old as time. That is, and that's certainly what you have to manage because you're you were 100 percent right. By the way, I just I just looked it up out of curiosity. So looking at the SPY as a proxy for a lot of people's equity exposures and returns, the March 2000 high was not regained until May or June of 2007. And it did kind of hold through most of the rest of the year, but then obviously that was it. And by 
the end of the year, by December of 2007, you were already starting to feel the, at least in the market, the effects of the financial crisis, even though the earthquakes have been rumbling for a while. And then you didn't regain that level again until into 2013, right? And that's the S&P. That's not the NASDAQ. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty rough period of time. And, I, you know, again, high prices matter. Valuations matter. I, I, I don't, I'm not making a firm prediction either way about what might happen this go around, but you certainly can't look at that and not draw some pretty powerful lessons. And it feels like anything could happen this time around because maybe it is different in, in some ways. Um, so, you know, who knows whether historical parallels will hold water. Um, you know, I just think of Ray Dalio recently saying that cash is still trash because you have interest rates below the rate of inflation. So you are losing ground if you're holding cash. And I think, you know, a a lot of folks, the knee-jerk reaction in a market environment like this is to go to cash, but that may not be the answer. And and we'll just have to see what happens because, um, you know, it's anybody's guess where inflation will settle out. Um, you know, I guess if you've listened to me in the past, you probably know I'm more on the high side where I say, we're going to continue to have a problem here. Um, but nobody really knows. And, um, I feel like, you know, the answer still for long-term investors is to own good businesses at reasonable prices, uh, that can kind of pass through any inflationary, uh, pressures, um, in pricing. I totally agree. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much, uh, Elliot and Phil, for this discussion. I hope everyone listening enjoyed it as well. Talk to you guys next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to This Week in Intelligent Investing, brought to you exclusively by MOI Global, the research-driven membership organization. Learn more at moiglobal.com.